Hello. Uh, yeah, I think that works. Great. Yeah, welcome to our talk. Um, we will talk about uh, net neutrality, obviously, um, with a focus on what happened in the last year and also what happened in the past years in the Netherlands, uh, particularly because they have a net neutrality law uh, for quite some time now, and we want to look at the experience, what sessions can be learned from it, and also look at a more global and European perspective. But uh, first to us two. Uh, my name is Thomas Loninger. I am based in Vienna and work there for Initiative for Netzfreiheit. Um, I'm also a member of Digitale Gesellschaft here in Germany. And I had the privilege to work with European Digital Rights in their Brussels office uh, during the hot phase of the negotiations about the Telecom Single Market Proposal, the net neutrality law in Europe that we will talk about. So, and I'm Reo Zenger, and I'm working for Bits of Freedom. Uh, we are a Dutch uh, civil rights organization. And um, uh, because lots of topics which have an impact on the Netherlands are coming from a European level, um, we are also working a lot in Brussels with EDRI and other organizations. Um, and um, at the end of this talk, we would like you to remember two things. Um, so the first thing would be ordinary citizens put net neutrality on the political agenda before, and we need to do that again. The second thing I want you to remember um, when you leave this hall is there are, uh, there are a number of unsolved issues, um, and we need your expertise to solve those. But first, let's get back to what is net neutrality. Yeah, um, we have a simple definition here from thisisnetneutrality.org, which is also the website of the Global Coalition on Net Neutrality, where NGOs from all around the world assemble uh, to fight a more and more globalized battle when it comes to open internet and, and freedom online. And basically it states that we have to keep the internet open as a platform and um, prevent discrimination from all sorts. Um, you can also look at net neutrality from its principles, and there are really three principles. Uh, first is end-to-end. -end. So the internet, um, different than other networks, like for example the TV network, is a network of peers, where every end node has the possibility to make a connection to any other end node. And there is no centralized control, there is no one single authorization hub where I have to register where I have to um, ask for allowance for every connection that I want to establish. Instead, it's left up to the end nodes to decide um, whether a connection is legitimate, is correct, is legal. This is um, both a technological decision. Back in the days when the internet was invented, uh, it served the purpose of um, implementing the optimal network design because we didn't have the calculated power to make decisions in the network hubs. But it's also a political decision about disabling control within the network. The second principle which is tied into that is the best effort. Best effort means that within the internet, within the transit nodes, there should be no differentiation between packages. So uh, every data packet is transmitted like every other, and there should be no distinction based on the protocol or the source or the destination um, or presumed legality of the packages. This best effort principle also applies not only to technical discrimination, but also to economic discriminations. Because what we see increasingly is that uh, the price of certain data packages varies. That some packages cost more than others. Um, there's a practice called zero rating, uh, where certain uh, services are excluded from your monthly data cap. So even if you have no megabytes left for this month, you can still use Facebook or Spotify and stuff like that. And there's a third principle that is essential for understanding the debate, and that's the reason why we have to fight this fight. Because providers want to vertically integrate along the value chain of their network. They see how much money can be made with us as consumers, with us as users who give away their data, and they just want to have a piece of the cake. They want to have a piece of the profit that Google or Amazon are making with us over their network. So in a way, they see us as their captive audience, and their goal is to establish a kind of double-sided market where they sell us, their customers, to the service providers that want to reach us, or don't just sell us internet instead, they also want to sell us each individual service that we want to use. Uh, we put these in pictures, and uh, 
you might know that because that's a very popular image. It was created several years ago, and we were often called fear mongers for putting something like that up. You know, like you have to pay if you want to play World of Warcraft or uh, if you want to read the New York Times. So every single service suddenly has a price tag on the internet. But sadly, this has become reality. This is an offer of uh, T-Mobile Hungary. Um, there are even worse offers from um, Orange France, where you have each individual type of service with a price tag. These are actually not euros, these are Hungarian forint. <laughs> but uh, Google Translate, thank you. Um, but we have seen a huge increase in uh, the products in Europe that violate net neutrality. According to the Digital Fuel Monitor, we are a little bit above um, 100 of such net neutrality violating products right now in Europe. So this is a debate which is happening really fast, and the market is creating facts. Um, the longer politicians wait to establish any meaningful legislation that would safeguard net neutrality, the longer is their window of opportunity to just create new facts and abolish the principle of net neutrality. But now on the bright side, to the Netherlands. So that doesn't happen if you have net neutrality uh, enshrined by law, and that's what happened in the Netherlands. Um, we have this law since 2013, the, uh, sorry, yeah, it went in effect uh, at the beginning of 2013. So we have this law now for about uh, two years. Um, that didn't come, that didn't just fall out from the sky. Um, we, uh, this, this law became, came there because of, after a long debate. And um, that debate, or sorry, yeah, the debate, we couldn't do that by our own. We, as a bit of freedom, we have been doing this with uh, lots of work with volunteers. Um, so two years before this debate uh, started, we already wrote down a, a position paper in which we said um, why net neutrality is important and uh, how, it should, how it should look like. That position paper was written with the help of volunteers. And when KPN announced uh, they were thinking, they were planning to um, to, uh, to monetize the use of WhatsApp by, its, by their users, um, people got angry and um, we were able to build a campaign site and have those people explain their angriness with the politicians, with members of parliament. And only because all those people did that, um, it became um, a topic on the political agenda. And that's very important to remember because it will it, it shows that um, if you are angry about something and you tell politicians about it, then something can change. And without you speaking out, the change will not happen. So then what actually we have in law? Um, to read a law, it's very important to look first at the uh, explanatory memorandum. It's a kind of addendum to the law and which explains why you have this law. And in the Netherlands, the law, that, that explanatory memorandum is very clear. It says, the net neutrality article aims to maximize the choice and freedom of expression on the internet for end users. It also says that end users should be able to decide what content they want to send and receive. So if there is um, something unclear about a text in a law, if there are um, uh, different interpretations of that law, then the lawyers will look at this explanatory memorandum to see how it should be, uh, how, how they should decide on that. So this text in this explanatory memorandum is a very important part of the law. The law itself says, providers of internet access services do not hinder or slow down applications and services on the internet. So, they are not allowed to block access to specific websites, they are not allowed to throttle um, access to other websites. And of course, this is a rule, so there are exceptions. And in this case, there are four exceptions. I will mention two of them. The first exception is to minimize the effects of congestion. So, think of a, a location where you have only a limited amount of capacity. Think of a, um, a music festival. Um, you have uh, lots of users in a very short period and on a temporary, uh, a lot, you have temporary lots of users in a, in a small location and the capacity of the network may not be uh, sufficient for the use, for all of the uh, users. So the network operator in that case may uh, restrict uh, traffic 
certain traffic. They, he may restrict uh, access to certain websites. But, and that's the second half of the sentence, it's important then that equal types of traffic, that they are treated equally. And that means if um, such a network operator would decide to block access to YouTube, he would also need to, ex uh, to block access to similar websites like Vimeo. Um, a second exception is to preserve uh, the integrity and the security of the network and, um, and uh, the service of the provider or the customer premises equipment, so uh, the router of the customer. Think of a slash 24 that is hijacked and that is only serving uh, nasty malware. And the nasty malware may be, um, may be of harm to the, um, to the network. In that case, um, the provider may choose to block access to that network. Um, and then there's one other part in the provision which is very important. It's this one and it says, providers do not make the price dependent on the services or the applications which are offered or used. So a provider is in the Netherlands not allowed to um, uh, allow a, sorry, to publish or to, to make available a, um, a, a new service which is competitive to the ones already on the internet and not charge for that one while charging for the other ones. or uh, if they get into agreement with, for example, Spotify, not charging for Spotify. So that would be in, um, just like Thomas already explained, it would be not, um, uh, uh, so that it would not get off from the data cap you have. Um, so how does it compare to other laws uh, in, around the world? Yeah, um, we made, yeah, thank you. Uh, we made a little comparison chart about um, how these different laws um, compared to each other. And here you have, um, like, most of the net neutrality legislations that are around the world right now. And it's not only just, uh, laws, it's also what we call soft law, like self-regulation, where the regulator and the ISPs come together and, um, make some rules and then, um, the ISP decides that he wants to follow this. Like, a little bit like corporal social responsibility, um, we decided we don't want to do the nasty stuff. Um, these soft laws, uh, usually have the big problem that they are not enforceable. Uh, Norway was the first country ever in the world to do anything about net neutrality back in 2008. And um, they also have this big ISP called Telenor. And uh, this one just decided he want to step out of the soft regulation and uh, just basically do whatever he wants. Uh, Telenor was also the second ISP after Comcast to go into an agreement with Netflix. So soft laws don't work. Hard law is the only stuff that um, really matters. Then price discrimination, that's exactly what uh, Rayo just mentioned before, um, that I don't discriminate based on the network, on the technical side, but only on the economical side with the pricing of certain data packages. And um, there we see that uh, Chile and the Netherlands have really good solutions found for that. Uh, the Netherlands honestly is one of the best in the world. And um, on the other sides, particularly there where we have soft laws, um, this is not in the scope. Um, then prevent two white SS. SS stands for specialized services. I'm sure you heard of that. Specialized services, uh, we all know it as triple play. If you do not only buy internet from your ISP, but also your telephone and your TV, this is called a triple play uh, or a specialized service because there are other services running through the same pipes, but they are not internet. There is something different. That's also what qualifies a specialized service. It is special. It's not just another random online service that we know from the internet. And under this category also legitimately fall things like telemedicine. If you want to do an operation, you don't want to do it over the internet. Um, like self-driving cars and industry 4.0, whatever that means. If it's a critical thing, then you don't want to run it over the internet, then it is a specialized service because it's set apart from everything else that's happening in the internet. But there's a problem with that. Although we have this nicely laid out concept, um, which is also historically have been, has been the way uh, in which regulators looked at the market and looked what internet service providers did all around the world, um, slowly these barriers between online services and specialized services have weakened and things have been reclassified. And these days we see stuff like Spotify, like Zatos, like Dailymotion, 
being operated under the category of specialized services or managed services, whatever you want to call it. And um, they're just abusing these loopholes, which often also exist in net neutrality legislation. This is a huge thing uh, for, for the European uh, debate we'll come to in a minute. So with this knowledge, what specialized services are, we can go back to the table and see that um, Slovenia is actually the best country that managed to distinguish these two types of services. And uh, the Netherlands and Chile, which have, in principle, really good legislations, um, just don't have this in their scope. Because usually, you also don't have to regulate specialized services. If you just want to keep the internet open and free, you can do this with plain and simple non-discrimination rules. And um, if the regulator does its job well, then usually you don't have to worry about just reclassifying services. Um, just to go a little bit in the other uh, columns, blocking of uh, competitors is usually something which comes with every net neutrality legislation. You all know that if you uh, have, uh, think Vodafone is it here in Germany, if you have a contract and they prohibit you from using Skype or any other voice of IP uh, service so that you have to use their expensive roaming instead of going to a competitor, uh, that's a widespread practice. Uh, here in Europe that you block your competitors in the terms of services so that your customers have no freedom of choice and cannot switch to another service. Um, and yeah, there are only these two laws in, in Europe, in the Netherlands and Slovenia. UK and Switzerland have some non-functional soft regulations. And funny enough, South Korea is the only country in Asia that uh, ever touched the subject. Um, that will go to the Latin American countries later. But now to the European debate. That's really where the meat of this talk lies. Um, in September 2013, the European Commission proposed new regulation uh, called Telecom Single Market. That's a huge legislative package which regulates stuff like roaming, acquiring spectrums, but also net neutrality. Uh, but sadly, the net neutrality parts of this law were really like the opposite of net neutrality. They would allow ISPs to basically do everything they want, to have their vertical integration and establish themselves as gatekeepers, what we can do online. So we were really outraged about this proposal. And then we decided a year ago, uh, here in 30C3, uh, to start a campaign. Uh, more or less, we launched a campaign. It was already up there a year ago. And you can still find it at safetyinternet.eu. And this campaign really tipped the favor in the European Parliament. Um, we wanted citizens to first get them informed about what's happening here and also get them engaged and do something about the internet. And we offered them three ways of doing that. First, of course, they could send an email to they are parliamentarians, and also they could call them free of charge. And the really funny thing was that we also had the possibility of sending faxes to the offices of the MEPs. And this was funny and this was new. Because in the European Parliament, it's like uh, the, the fax machine is also the printer. So you cannot really disconnect the fax machine without also disconnecting the printer. And <laughs> And uh, so people could just go to the website. Uh, we had some boilerplate uh, texts, um, which were also uh, at the current debate, you know, like uh, which committee is discussing what. But people could also just uh, put in their random messages and uh, make their message come out physically in the office of the MEP. And um, this was a huge success. Um, here's some facts about it. Um, over 40,000 faxes were uh, send out, click, at least from 21,000, we can uh, say for sure that they were also delivered because we only had uh, three SS7 gateways, so at the high peaks there were much more faxes that we could send through, but still this is a lot of paper and dead trees. Um, the website uh, we, we had, Safety Internet, was translated in nine languages, and I want to touch on this subject because particularly for this technical audience this might be interesting. A whole website was on GitHub. So the source code of our campaign website was on an uh, open source collaborative uh, portal. And so everybody could look at the source code, uh, propose changes. And we also had a readme section where you could 
uh, learn how to translate the whole website. And uh, that's the reason why we managed to have nine translations, even in Albanian. They are not even part of the EU, but somebody from Albania thought, this is an important issue, I want my people to be informed about it. So I think this is really a best practice for uh, the digital civil liberties community that we should open source our campaigns, not only that others can learn from it, but also to allow other people to, to get engaged and maybe elaborate on language, on languages, or uh, just find typos. And yeah, I mentioned before that I had the um, privilege to work in Brussels with the European Digital Rights Office and we did a lot of advocacy work there. Uh, you have to understand EDRI, European Digital Rights, as well as Access Now, are the two only organizations that take care of our civil liberties within Brussels, in the European bubble. And they do a tremendously important work and uh, we did so many things over this, these months, but a um, few want to highlight because they're also best practices. We uh, analyzed each and every amendment that was tabled to the legislative text. Um, we wrote booklets, we wrote uh, many one-pages, for example, to get small and medium-sized companies involved in the debate. Net neutrality is also a competition issue. And they helped us a lot because suddenly it was not just left liberal civil liberty people calling the MEPs, it was companies from their own country telling them, I will lose my existence or I will have a much harder time uh, competing online if you pass this legislation. And this helped a lot. And um, one thing why this lady here, Neely Cruz, the commissioner for the digital agenda back then, is on the BIMA right now, is that um, we also had many lobby documents that we created to kind of keep ahead of the narrative, which was always pressured because the telco lobby was, was always fighting with us. It was a really short-term battle. And we uh, had one really good trick which worked well, uh, which was that we made our messages funny. Uh, we like we wrote subtitles to speeches of the commissioner, uh, which not only showed real meaning of what he was saying, but they also were funny. They um, revealed the truth, and the assistants liked them. The assistants sent it around to their friends in the parliament, and so our messages spread really widely, much faster than they would usually do. Um, we have to look at the time, but um, to finish up with Europe. That's basically the outcome that we had. We won in plenary with the votes of the Social Democrats, the Liberals, the Greens and the left. Um, and we got real net neutrality. Uh, you will see it later in the legal comparison. Um, this is a huge success because nobody believed that we would actually make it in the European Parliament. It was so close to the election. It's such a complex issue. But still, because people got engaged, we could uh, turn the favor and, and the parliamentarians passed a really good text. Um, <laughs> thank you. Still, the text is not perfect because enforcement is weak, but we'll come to that later. First, I want to uh, go to the, the basic principle of how a law is done in Europe. Looks like that. The Commission proposes legislation. Only the Commission can do that. And then it has to go through the parliament, where all the representatives that we all vote sit, uh, the 751 people, and we have the council, where the 28 member states sits. So mostly the ministries. When it comes to net neutrality, it's mostly the economic or the infrastructure ministry that deals with these things. So currently we're at this stage. The commission proposed really shitty tax, which would kill net neutrality. The parliament saved it, and now it's up to the council, because it's 1-1. And the council is the fight where we are right now. And to give you an overview again in the same scheme as before, um, the commission proposed something really bad, which basically fails on all levels. The parliament did a great job. They like, they put the solution forward. Then the Italian presidency um, had uh, two proposals. More or less both of them were shit. And then the Polish and the Dutch government came forward with really good language. Um, they more or less oriented themselves on the uh, Dutch legislation and uh, really proposed a good text. Uh, we're speaking of October, November here, and it really looked good back then. But this December, Germany put forward a text which um, changed the whole game, because Germany 
proposed a tax which would basically allow all sorts of discrimination on all levels. They even allow uh, blocking your competitors, which is something most national legislations would never do. Not even the Italians allowed that, but the Germans still would allow that in their text. And uh, the real satirical thing is that they are selling this as a compromise. Merkel is saying, this is a compromise between the internet society and the industry lobby. It is not a compromise, not even closely. And we have to call them out, particularly the Social Democrats, because it's Sigmar Gabriel who is negotiating this. And the Social Democrats still have some pressure points, they still feel something. I think the Conservatives are lost in this issue. But with the Social Democrats, I think there is still hope. And this is an issue which has to be resolved within Germany. In the Council, uh, we have some other big countries which are opposing us. And so if Germany is following up on this line, the outlook is quite bad. So Save the Internet was uh, like relaunched in a version 2.0. And we now have uh, a new website which allows you to send emails to the ministries and uh, the permanent representatives of your country. Again, you have boilerplate emails, but it's better if you write your own text, why you think net neutrality is important from your perspective. And um, just to summarize the European stuff, there's a basic premise, a basic goal behind what the Commission and Germany as well as the UK and Spain, all countries with big incumbent telcos like Deutsche Telekom, like Vodafone, like Telefonica, big ISPs that are domestically engaged. They all want market consolidation. This means instead of the like 150 small and medium ISPs that we have right now in Europe, they want to shrink it down to just four big pan-European ISPs. Very similarly to the way the American market is structured right now. Um, there are several reasons for that. They believe that this will boost the economy, economy of sales, uh, it would create more jobs, and ultimately it would lead to more infrastructure investment. They know that it will cost billions to uh, make Europe uh, uh, fit when it comes to, to fiber, to the new bandwidth that we all need for the uh, 21st century. And uh, they believe this bet that if we give the ISPs regulatory holidays, they will just start um, investing in infrastructure. The second summary I have to take is that we suck in the council. We are really good at um, getting people engaged to the commission and also to the parliament. But when it comes to the council, where all 28 member states sit, uh, as internet society, we don't have the, the, the capacity or the architecture to really put pressure on them. Organizations like Greenpeace can do that because they are in every country and coordinate pan-Europeanly. Uh, we still have to catch up in this regard because we see this not only in net neutrality, also the fight about data retention and data protection was similar. And uh, I have to hurry up. National fallbacks are necessary because if we fail with this law, the earliest we will get European legislation that would safeguard net neutrality is 2018. And remember what I said before, the market is creating facts. So we may not have time until 2018 at the earliest. So maybe national fallbacks are necessary to at least keep the principle alive in some European countries. Now, to the Dutch experience. Thank you. <clears throat> so before we had net neutrality in the Netherlands, uh, the telcos were um, explaining to the people like in, um, if you have net neutrality by law, then your uh, subscription will be a lot more expensive than it is now. Um, and I can tell you, our experience, that's not the case. Maybe it has become a bit more expensive, but definitely not that expensive. That is a lot of difference. But what did uh, we experience? So the Dutch law is being enforced by an array named ACM. It's the Authority for Consumers and Markets. And um, I can say, or I would say that the uh, enforcement is mediocre at best. There have been five, inve five investigations have uh, started, and uh, three of those are still underway, and only two of them have a ruling. One of those rulings is quite good, the other one is surprisingly bad. The first one is, um, uh, has with, uh, with internet in a train. And internet in a train in the Netherlands is more like this. <laughs> um, 
So the Internet in a Train is offered by T-Mobile via the uh, mobile uh, network. And of course that one is limited and is frequently changing capacity uh, that is available. And without network management, of course, that would be um, uh, not working at all. So the Dutch Railways is um, blocking access to video websites and is uh, throttling um, uh, file sharing protocols. And the question brought forward to the uh, NRA was, is that a uh, violation of net neutrality? The NRA said, we believe that in this case, blocking and delaying services that require large capacity is necessary to minimize the effects of congestion on mobile connection. So the NRA said it's not a violation because for, uh, for one, it's necessary because there's a limited cap capacity available, and second, because the blocking and slowing down is done indiscriminately. So this is not a, a violation of the Dutch uh, net neutrality law, and I think that's, um, um, that, that sounds reasonable to me. The other case is SIS, which is a kind of a brand of a, of a telco Vodafone and the content provider RTL. Their offer is a subscription where you can have um, uh, voice, text and internet access on your mobile phone. And in addition to that, you can get an app. And an app allows you allows the customers to watch RTL content without charging uh, the customer's data plan. So you get that RTL content for free. Uh, in other words, that's, the, uh, that's what they call zero rated or sponsored uh, data. That's a clear violation of net neutrality, of course, uh, both in the principle and the uh, net neutrality law in the Netherlands. Um, but the NRA's response to this one is a bit curious. In the end they say, Vodafone will end this violation by offering the SIS app as a separate service, which can be used independent to the internet access service. Um, so the NRA agrees that this is a violation and something needs to change. Um, SIS may proceed, provided that the SIS app is offered as a separate uh, service, they name it like that. Um, so pr practically that means that you as a consumer may uh, get a, a subscription where you can get data, sorry, where you can get a voice and text and you can get the app and see the RTL content even if you don't have internet access on that uh, subscription. But it also means that if you have a subscription where you have voice, text and internet access, you also get this separate service for free and that means that in the end, nothing has changed because you have subscriptions with full internet access and next to it an uh, RTL app with content that comes free. So in my opinion, this solution they thought of is um, um, not a, a real solution because the net neutrality violation is still intact. So it's a horrible ruling, and I've been told that uh, the Minister of Economic Affairs was, wasn't amused when uh, they became aware of this ruling. So, what are the open debates? Um, in the Netherlands, uh, the, minister, uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs is um, drafting a new uh, policy document which would make some of those um, uh, edge cases, which are not clear now, uh, which would uh, clarify those situations. And um, there are three topics which are mentioned in this uh, document. First of all, the question, should uh, an ISP that, is net, that, that provides you with net neutrality uh, connection, should they do also IPv6? Should, should they be forced to provide IPv6? The government says, okay, that's not the case because IPv4 and IPv6 is what is used as a transport layer and net neutrality is only about um, the services that are used, that are provided over this layer. So uh, IPv6 would not be a requirement if you have uh, net neutrality. The other thing they are discussing is uh, what exactly is a internet access service? So that's the word that is used in the law, but it's not, that doesn't have a, um, a definition. So um, they are debating on what is actually an internet access service. So the internet in a train, that's a clear example. Everybody agrees that's, that's something which should be, um, uh, where net neutrality should apply. But for example, internet access in a hotel, that's a different case and they haven't yet decided. I think this will 
in the end, uh, net, uh, the internet access in a hotel is, will not be um, uh, uh, have, have, will not have the net neutrality law uh, applied. And then um, the SIS app already uh, mentioned. So the and also what Thomas already mentioned, you have these. Um, Separate services, managed service, single services, and I think that the uh, policy document that is drafted now will uh, provide more um, a clear structure on that as well. Okay. Yeah. Now we go to. Yeah. Thank you. Now we go to the global debate. Um, I think you may have noticed that um, there was something going on in the U.S. Um, Verizon succeeded in um, killing the, the old regulation about net neutrality in the US. Um, they just said that this hinders their freedom of speech to discriminate the content within their networks. And they actually got through with it and they killed the, the old regulation that the American regulator FCC proposed. And then this huge battle started in the US, uh, where also, again, a lot of civil society was engaged. Um, our sister campaign, safetyinternet.com, was revised. And many civil society groups, as well as Silicon Valley, joined into the fight. Because the new rules the FCC proposed uh, were really horrible, similarly to what the Germans just proposed or the commission originally put forward. And um, then also things happened like John Oliver touched the issue of net neutrality in his very popular daily show. And uh, this all spiked and aggregated so that uh, around 4 million comments were submitted to the uh, consultation the FCC had put up for the new rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, in general, we can say the, the, the question in the US really boils down to public opinion versus industry lobby. There is no question about the public opinion. Even in conservative Republican circles, net neutrality is seen as a good thing for competition, for freedom of speech, for various reasons. But still, the industry lobby manages to uh, make it a political issue and still uh, um, delay the decision. And then Obama um, came out and, and like publicly said net neutrality is important and we have to make it a law. And uh, the rules he proposed in his statement also looked really fine drafted, like he understood the problem and uh, proposed a real solution. But sadly, he is not the person to decide. It's this guy uh, whom he appointed, Tom Wheeler, the current chair of the American Regulatory Authority, FCC. It's his decision whether or not we'll have net neutrality uh, in the US or not. And um, we'll see, I guess, in 2015, this decision will fall either way. But it's definitely boils down to versus uh, public opinion versus industry lobbying. But it's not just the US and um, the EU. This debate is global. And particularly in Africa, net neutrality is a huge issue. Because most people there don't have any internet access at all. But what they sometimes have is so-called Facebook Zero, where everything they have from the internet is just Facebook, or Google, or Twitter. Those big companies that can afford to pay for the data that the customers need to reach them, or the users need to reach them, uh, um, those put up crazy stuff like Zeppelins that get their internet from a satellite and then project a, a GSM network in really rural areas. They really take money in their hands to bring internet in rural areas, but not real internet, only their services. And so there is a huge part of the population in some areas which only has, um, net, which only has these services. That's everything they know from the internet. Um, and this is really important if we look at development theory. I mean, um, I'm, I'm an anthropologist and, and this is a topic close to me. What we are doing in the global south is establishing new dependency circles. We are making these economies dependent on us, on our Western services. We actively prevent local services to come up, startups in Africa that come up with the real needed services that the people have. There are good examples for that. Uh, Africa has established uh, elaborate SMS payment and information systems. SMS is often the only means of communication that the people have electronically. And still they manage to uh, uh, um, compensate with these tools the fact that most Africans don't have bank accounts. 
So there is a real need for modern uh, telecommunications technology in this continent. But still, the way this is heading is making the global south even more dependent to Western companies. And this is similarly, in a way, the case in Asia, where also zero rating is really common. Uh, but the net neutrality debate is not. South Korea is the only country that has legislation on this topic, and it's not really good. And the, the, in general, the net neutrality paradigm is not really widespread in Asia. Um, differently so in Latin America. As I mentioned before, Chile was the first country to uh, make a law about net neutrality, and actually a quite good one. It was copied by, by Peru and Ecuador. Uh, recently, also Brazil adopted the Marco Civil, a constitutional law about internet, which also includes provision about net neutrality. And also Mexico recently put a law forward, which is not good, but still, they did something on this topic. So Latin America is a really interesting area when it comes to net neutrality. Another final thing I want to mention is probably something uh, a little bit heated, but I feel really strongly about it, and I, I want to speak out about it. We all love Wikipedia, and, um, but sadly there is a stain on that love, uh, at, at least for me. Wikipedia Zero is a, a product of um, Wikipedia. It's a project which they run, where they do exactly the same as Facebook, basically. They pay for the data that, uh, or they, they make agreements with ISPs, there's actually no money flowing, but they make agreements with ISPs so that Wikipedia is excluded from any data charges. So if I have a feature phone and I have only a contract where I have a few SMS and a few minutes per month I can, I can phone with somebody and I have no internet, I can still see Wikipedia, I can still edit Wikipedia, um, but that's the only thing I see from the internet. Of course, they're doing this to foster uh, the, the sum of all human knowledge. They want to get their market, their service out there to more people. Like Facebook, they see that only one billion people is in the internet, but there are much more people in the world, and so why don't we try to reach those? Um, ultimately, it's also about brand establishing themselves uh, in these new markets, which will soon have internet and hopefully will develop. Um, but imagine if Encyclopedia Britannica had a service like this 10 years ago. Something like Wikipedia never could have come into existence because there would already be one incumbent player that's hugely dominant, that has uh, 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 a free access to all the customer base. And it doesn't matter if it's the best service, but it's free. And so people will use that. And Wikipedia as a community project never would have uh, uh, taken off and, and come to the point where they are right now. Um, so, the reason, I mean, this, this is all known for, for quite some time, but the reason why I wanted to, to mention this here is because of this letter. Chile um, amended its net neutrality law to prohibit price discrimination, zero rating. They want to outlaw that as well. And Wikimedia actively engaged in the policy debate in Chile and fought this amendment, fought civil rights legislation to keep loopholes in there that would allow them to offer Wikipedia Zero. And this was the tipping point for me where I thought uh, this is not going in the right direction. If uh, a, a public foundation actively engages in a policy battle abroad in another country to fight uh, good legislation that has been pushed for uh, by civil society, uh, we really have a problem we have to talk about. And also, even if we accept the basic premise that Wikipedia Zero is a good thing, uh, it's hard to question whether Chile is the right country for it, because Chile is not Africa. Uh, in Chile, you have to spend like 2% of your monthly income to uh, afford a mobile prepaid internet subscription. That's similarly to Denmark. You know, we are not speaking of a, of a country where there is no internet. In average, per 100 people in Chile, they have 130 mobile subscriptions. So, we're not speaking of a developing country. Still, I've been, I've been at Wikimania and I've talked with, with people from the foundation that are tasked with dealing these things, and uh, um, there are country criteria for which countries Wikipedia Zero is considered or not. Um, 
they said they would publish them. Actually, so far they've done nothing. Um, and I think to, to end this debate, we have to go back to the vision statement of the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share the sum of all knowledge. This is our commitment. And I'm questioning whether this sum of all knowledge can only be one service of the internet. Because what they're doing is also they are opening the floodgates. Facebook Zero is right behind them. Once Wikipedia Zero is established in a country, there is no way you can prevent Facebook Zero from following on their steps. And so uh, we really have to look at the larger picture here, uh, whether we want to continue um, in this direction. Uh, and I also have to say that uh, th there is a battle within Wikimedia, and it's mostly the foundation and some lawyers within the foundation that are pushing for this. Uh, um, on, on, on local chapters, it might look differently. So for time constraints, I'm going to do this quick, rather quickly. Um, so remember at the beginning, I was talking um, about the two things you should remember when you're leaving uh, this room. Um, uh, the first thing was ordinary citizens uh, put net neutrality on the political agenda before, and we need to do that again. So that's what Thomas uh, discussed uh, about the European legislation. If uh, we want net neutrality uh, enshrined in European law, then we, you need to get in touch with your um, ministries in your, uh, in your member state. Because only that will um, make them convinced that the peep that you um, think in a net neutrality is important. So you need, uh, so you can do that. So go to uh, the website safetyinternet.eu um, and um, um, help make this point. If you want to do more, uh, get in touch with your a regional, national, digital civil rights organization and do and help them with whatever you're good at. And if you can't spend any time, um, uh, do a donation and help them financially. The other thing um, I mentioned in the beginning was there are unsolved issues and civil society needs your expertise. So one of those unsolved issues is uh, the one that goes on um, uh, uh, the, the problem with uh, uh, peering and transits. I'm not going to into details on that now, but if you want to help think with us on that, um, then come to Noisy Square tomorrow at 5, uh, where we have a workshop and where we will discuss that problem. For now, question everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, even though it took longer than initially planned, we still have quite some time for questions. Um, let's start here in the hall on mic three and then go to the internet. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of things uh, which are quite important for network networking as well. There's uh, first, you want to have a play level playing field, uh, not just at the IP level, but also also on the fiber. So, uh, I think uh, probably some of you already know uh, Stockup, which is in Stockholm. Uh, they have a municipality-owned uh, fiber oper operator, and that's uh, like 10 years ago already. Uh, it was very common in Stockholm to get a fiber to home. Uh, at, uh, at that time, it was 100 megabits or something like that. But uh, that's uh, kind of critical. Also, if you look at the new US market, uh, Google Fiber is doing the same thing over there. Um, and that's, uh, and there, I had some other points as well. But uh, let's, uh, there's also the complaint that the, the operators always keep complaining about uh, how they can't uh, profitably run something. It's important to tell them that, okay, fine, we give that job uh, to somebody else because uh, uh, the, uh, not just the fibers, but just about every, every service uh, you can, if you level the playing field, there will be someone who wants that market. And uh, at the moment, if uh, Tele Deutsche Telekom tells you that uh, they can't do it, uh, then uh, in the process, you can also screw the, screw the Tele Deutsche Telekom, <laughs> which is very big benefit. Uh, Okay, that's... Me, me. While you think of an answer, can I please remind everybody who is leaving, be 
quiet. Thank you. Okay. Just some question, uh, uh, one, one comment about what you said, and, and particularly uh, mentioning Stockholm. Uh, personally, just as a note, I think functional separation is something we should aim for. And I would like to see functional separation uh, in, in, in the political programs of uh, political parties, because that's honestly the only real solution for the competition problem. As long as a company owns the infrastructure and also provides the access service over it, there will be no real competition. Only if you separate those two, uh, uh, um, you can really adequately assess the cost of uh, infrastructure investment. You can have a logical decision about where to invest in infrastructure and you have a race to the top instead of to the bottom when it comes to offering the maximum bandwidth technically possible. Now a question from the internet. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Uh, there is one question, um, whether there is a collaboration sought with the Internet Society, the ISOC, to gain people power for Brussels. Um, we, uh, particularly Access Now is working uh, on this field with uh, the, the international internet bodies. Uh, there is also the uh, Net Neutrality Coalition, which was founded to uh, more foster the ac academic debate, but they're also close to all the ITF and, and similar bodies. Um, and there has been talk about like establishing net neutrality as a basic principle on a UN level. Um, but these are all long-term programs, and usually they don't kick back towards the, the, the real hard national or supranational policy debates that we have in Europe or in the US. Definitely for the long term, I think this is something we have to look at, but sh short, medium term, I think not, not much will happen there. Now on microphone one, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for your talk and thank you for the great work already done for the European Parliament. Now the fight is in the Council. That means that the fight is in all of the European member states. The problem is that we need to organize the fight that you did in the Netherlands for each national state. How do we, how do, we do that? How do we engage consumer organizations and make this about competition, equal markets and consumers? Because they weren't part of the organizations that you mentioned there. Um, there we actually established an answer to that. Uh, it's a global coalition on net neutrality, um, which is a network of NGOs all around the world that care about net neutrality. A good example is recently in Tunis, uh, an ISP proposed new products, which is very similar to the ones that the uh, KPN ISP in the Netherlands proposed that, that kind of pushed the debate towards the point where the net neutrality law was established. And because we had this global network, we could provide the local Tunisian NGO with all the information, all the arguments, all the materials they needed to quickly uh, uh, respond to this threat. So this is a global debate and we'll see it pop up in many more countries. And I think only global collaboration uh, uh, and information sharing and open source can help to really uh, win this battle because the other side has so much more money than we. So, and in addition to that, um, Thomas already mentioned during his talk, to, during the talk that um, we suck at the council. That's a problem which is not limited to net neutrality debate only. So, I think that the um, NGOs in Europe need to uh, make an effort there and see and see how we can uh, do this better. And. Um, so for the Netherlands, it's fairly easy. We are uh, a fairly professional organization, but um, it's not just about the Netherlands. It's also about other countries, where other member states, where they have um, um, less organized, uh, where there's less organized organizations. So um, I'm not sure what the, the actual answer, answer is to your question, uh, but it's definitely a hard one and definitely one we need to fix. Now back to mic three. Well, you come from the train, they could just use prescribed bandwidth limits. But my question is there, is there any exemptions for emergency services in zero rating, for example? Because on the traditional land voice calls, you don't, you don't even need a subscription or even a SIM card in your phone <laughs> to call the emergency services. So is there exemptions like that around? And what about the costs price into things differently based on the cost of providing the service. For example, could I give my lodger one megabit, one little megabit Ethernet cable to my 10 megabit ADSL? 
line, but they still access my PC at a much faster speed because local traffic is much cheaper to provide. So can local traffic be higher bandwidth? Uh, the scale could apply to interplanetary traffic as well, <laughs> as well as that, for example. So I'm not sure whether I understand the question correctly, but if it is that um, you could make a difference in um, in a subscription for local traffic and um, and have a, a different price attached to that um, compared to uh, traffic which is non-local, then uh, I think that uh, is not a good idea. But and it would not work for the uh, within the Dutch rules we have now. Yeah, but I'm not sure if that. If, if I gave an answer to your question. <laughs> I, I make another uh, attempt to answer what I understood. Uh, um, I, I mean, we, we had this, uh, usually net neutrality legislation doesn't prohibit uh, you from, for example, prioritizing emergency numbers. Or also to like, uh, uh, if you have SSH sessions, which you need to administer this, the infrastructure, those of course can be prioritized. Um, these things which, which fulfill a, a purpose um, and you then implement this purpose, application agnostic, so to all providers and protocols which fulfill this purpose, then that's totally in line with net neutrality. Uh, um, application agnostic, uh, you can do a lot of things, particularly when it comes to that. And to the, to the payment part, I was not, not totally sure what, what you mean. It, it's definitely not in line with net neutrality that you pay according to the geographical distance the data is flowing, or, or the, 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 I mean, of course, an ISP can differentiate uh, themselves from uh, the bandwidth they are offering you, the uh, access technology they, they are offering you. These things are, okay, it's, it starts getting critical when you look inside the data stream and you make a differentiation between the service that you actually use in this pipe. I don't know, an answer this? Uh, but my question is, can the charge stiffly for different pipes out their network? So. Or something like no. 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 And usually you have like the abstraction layer. You often don't know which which local physical pipe uh, any connection will run through, and within one session, the actual physical route that the package is, is taking can change. So this would not work. Okay. Uh, time is getting close to an end, but microphone three, please. Okay, um, I'm working for a small ISP, actually, and um, we are fully support net neutrality. And my, you took uh, the answer to my question right now. Um, my question is, um, if we, if we uh, take uh, all, packages equal, straight, all packages equally, then uh, maybe voice over IP calls may get uh, some bad connections. And... Um, if you would implement a quality of service for this, would this uh, fulfill the um, mind of net neutrality or um, would it be something broken? Yeah. So um, remember the explanatory memorandum I showed in the beginning. That tells what the goal is of the um, Dutch net neutrality law. Um, so. The goal is, again, to maximize the freedom of speech, the, the freedoms um, uh, of the internet user. So with that in mind, um, doing quality of service, to a certain extent, is acceptable because it will um, uh, improve this freedom. If you would not apply this quality of service, then uh, the freedom would deter deteriorate. So, for example, uh, voice over IP, um, uh, it's very helpful to do some quality of service there because otherwise you can't make a call um, and doing the quality of service you provide that you do this for all for it, uh, in the same way um, that will help freedom so that will be okay and one last question uh, from microphone two please well it's not the question is more like a comment um, i've seen i think you did the talk last year on this one right well, back then it seemed like everything is doomed and nothing can be changed anymore. And I was quite surprised coming in here today and hearing all this stuff because my sort of my, my uh, attention drifted away from it. And all I wanted to say is like, thank you for whatever you did. It's just magic that it happened to be like this right now. So again, it's many, not many what people. we did. 
or did. not only it's what you did yes because all of you uh, went to right went to save the internet <laughs> of the eu and uh, sent a fax to the members of parliament yeah and, and that made a change and if you didn't you have to do it now <laughs> yeah unfortunately That's all the time uh, we have. So once again, thank you for your talk and um, for your input and the political work of everybody here.